Hi, everyone. It is June 4th, 2021. I have some pretty scary things to show you. What is being done in elementary schools, and it is not just public schools, but it it's all over. All over. Catholic schools, private schools, public schools. And if we cannot get this stopped... That means an entire generation of children will, will grow to be adults who have such a warped mind based on lies being told, and they are being groomed to be activists. Can you imagine an entire generation of activists? Okay, check this out. This is on, um, there's a lot of good Twitter accounts. My thin-formed MKE. Okay. Elementary school teacher shares her critical race theory anti-racist curriculum that she utilizes in the classroom and guess what? Sponsored by Pizza Hut. No joke. I checked it out. Pizza Hut. Really? Corporations are behind this? Isn't that odd? Well, it's an agenda for a globalist corporate takeover into the new world order that people could actually still call people conspiracy theorists when it's evident right smack in your face every single day happening. Okay. Even before people would enter into my classroom, they knew, like, Tiffany's classroom is the one, like, they'll do identity work, they're going to talk about racism. The beginning of the second week of school, I would take all of the books off of our bookshelf and put them in the middle of the rug, and I would, um, I told my students, I didn't like the way I organized the, the classroom book collection. I would love for you to organize it. And as you're organizing it, I want you to notice if we have more books that have white kids on the cover. I want you to notice who the authors are. I want you to notice like who, who we're missing from our book collection. And we would do this every year. So the book collection would change, which was exciting. And then we would do identity maps. And so we would talk about like, what is, what do we know about this kid? What is their skin color? What is their hair like? What is their community like? What do they like to do? And from there, like we would, t then we would make our own identity maps. We would talk about ourselves. I would talk about kind of what are the first things you notice about people? You notice their hair, you notice the color of their clothes, you notice their gender expression and you notice their skin color. Okay. Uh, is this appropriate for elementary school when they really need to be learning reading and writing cursive? Oh, right, they got rid of cursive. Uh, they need to learn math. Oh, math is racist. Um, any adult... And I'm sorry that a whole lot of these young teachers have also been indoctrinated, and they're passing, passing on the indoctrination to their students. But they are adults. And, and I'm sorry, you know, well, they should be educated. Oh, maybe a little bit of history. No. All right. We are seriously dumbed down, and that means that nothing, nothing can be done about all of these agendas unless the adults actually wake up, smell the coffee, recognize, hey, something's wrong, and, well, maybe do some research outside of mainstream media, and then they have to take action. And they have to take action yesterday. Mm. Well... That's the problem, because all of these agendas are accelerating to the point where it is, really, it's head spinning. Now, that's bad. That's bad. Let's watch this. 
And wow, okay. It's unfortunate that so many adult Americans are are really just mentally ill, like this teacher. Fifth grade students recite critical race theory sponsored, yeah, by Pizza Hut. Okay. Now, I had, uh, yeah, if I'm going to post a video on it, I'm going to watch it. And it was hard to get through the 11 minutes. I don't, I don't. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to get through the 11 minutes right now. But this is what's happening in elementary schools. Fifth grade. Every parent should be outraged. I cannot imagine a 7-year-old or a 15-year-old who would not be more excited about being able to guide their own learning and understanding than just doing what the teacher is telling you to do. One of the reasons I love starting with inquiry is because you don't need to have answers in the first lesson. My name is Allison Dempsey. This year I'm teaching fifth grade social studies in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Racist teaching and learning is upholding the systems and sort of like the classroom hierarchy. Inquiry-based learning challenges that model because the children guide the learning. I want to help break down the idea that race is a scientific concept and coax out this idea that race is, has been constructed and it has been constructed to keep one group in power over other people. The goal of my first lesson was to gather information about what my students know or what they think they know and what questions they have. So what are some racial differences that you've noticed around you? Who would like to share? People are different, so they get treated based on like um, how they look um, and what the, who would cite it as like um, the dominant culture. What is the dominant culture? What does the dominant culture do? They like, make people believe certain stereotypes about a certain group of people, not just um, blacks, but also um, browns or um, indigenous. Um, anybody whose skin color is um, darker. Dominant culture is for powerful people with power, and white people make other people think that black people are bad. So that's why black people don't have power. If a white person kills a black person, is they call it self-defense. But if a black person kills a white person, it says murder. Mm. That's, that's that's how unfair like black people's life is. They actually knew it. They actually said everything that we were going to be learning together. Um, they said it in a kid version maybe, but it was all that what they brought up was exactly, was exactly it. And I feel like what a lot of us. Okay, I can't sit through this again. Oh my God, that's frightening. Okay, if, what was that? If a, a white person is killed by a black person, it's self-defense. And if a black person kills a white person, it's murder. Wow. And she doesn't correct that. She doesn't do anything. In fact, she's really very happy, proud of her students that they get it. Okay. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get how? How? Unbelievably. Unbelievably. Sick and twisted is this critical race theory. Oh, you know, what a, what a, <laughs> yeah. Booker T. Washington. There is a certain class of race problem solvers who don't want the patient to get well because as long as the disease holds out, they have not only an easy means of making a living, but also 
an easy medium through which to make themselves prominent before the public. Wow. Words spoken long ago. And they're still you know, applicable to this day. I want you to listen to this. Now, it's unfortunate that the majority of Americans listen to the lowest of the low instead of listening to the scholars, to people like John McMorder, in which academic discipline is this circular, naive deer caught in the headlights response to a basic and urgent question considered insightful and excellent. Ah, okay. Kendi. Kendi. Uh, what's his first name? Abrim, Ibrim, Ibrim, Kendi. This is where critical race theory comes from. This is the, this is who everybody, like, looks to in terms of the critical race theory contemporary as it's being implemented right now, it's this guy, Kendi, along with another just absolutely insane woman, um, Robin DiAngelo, which I've done my research. Hopefully, I'll post a video on her because it's evident that Kendi and she are not scholars. They clearly have an agenda, and they're pushing it. Now, the agenda is, it's a Marxist agenda. And a whole lot of people think, oh, Marxist, you're so wrong. Marxism is about class. Hello? Could they not just kind of mm, revamp that Marxism to, well, race? In our country, in the United States, we didn't have the class divisions that an awful lot of countries still have, but certainly had way back when. Race has always been the divide. That's why race has always been played, that card played over and over. And boy, didn't Obama do a great job. He was supposed to be the great, oh my God, the Jesus incarnate reconciliator. Yeah. Okay. If we were a systemically racist country, there's no way that we would have a black president. Oh, but that's kind of lost on most, on most people because they're not using their brain. But listen to Kendi. You talked about the importance of defining racism. But I, but I, unless I missed it, which is possible, I don't. I didn't hear your personal definition. Is there, a, is there one that you would offer us? Like, how do you define racism? Sure. So racism, I would define it um, as a collection uh, of racist policies that lead to racial inequity that are substantiated by racist ideas. <laughs> Sure, a, a collection uh, of racist policies that lead to racial inequity that are substantiated by racist ideas. And anti-racism is a pretty simple using the same terms. Anti-racism is a collection of anti-racist policies leading to racial, anybody want to take a guess? Equity that are substantiated by anti-racist ideas. Got it? Did you get it? This, this guy uh, has been pretty much the influencer in terms of critical race theory. Okay. There are very few policies today that are being enacted that are racist policies against black people. There's an awful lot of policies coming out now 
they are racist, except the effect now is on white people. You cannot fight racism with racism. That's an obvious, that also seems to be lost on most people. But we have less and less intellectuals, uh, less and less people who actually critically think, and more and more of the emotional sorts. Triggered, triggered, personally triggered, all of this identity crap. Oh, you hurt me, you hurt me. But, you know, oh, man, you know, I, all right, hang on. Yes, everything now is catered to the individual who might get uh, hurt feelings over what? Something? I don't know. University of Washington student government wants the school to introduce content warnings in class. Content warnings in college. If implemented, students would be able to submit formal complaints about professors who don't use content warnings when discussing sensitive material. Oh, I'm so hurt. And if you go to, well, there's two college sites that I know of, Campus Reform and the College Fix. Go to these sites and see what's happening. It is so frightening. And these professors, the administrators, the, um, those who are working in the universities and colleges, I, there was a professor, I think, out of Massachusetts. I think even it was, could have been University of Mass Amherst. I, I may be wrong on this, so don't quote me on it. Who came out and said, universities and colleges are right-wing institutions. Yeah. Okay. No. This is leftist ideology, and they are destroying these kids. Destroying them. Yeah. Okay. Um, this I'm just going to play a few minutes of. John McWhorter, who was interviewed on Reason TV. America has never been less racist so let's just watch the introduction. It's not necessarily that you don't believe that this is the truth. You don't even want to see the truth. When actor Jesse Smollett lied about being attacked by racist MAGA hat wearing Trump supporters, Columbia University linguist John McWhorter actually interpreted it as a sign that we have come further on race than we're often comfortable admitting. If it really was 1960 except the window dressing had changed, there could not be a Rachel Dolezal and there could never be a serious-minded, intelligent, brilliant performing person like Jesse Smollett who pulls something like this and comes out of it thinking that he's been wronged. We're doing better than we think. Only in an America in which matters of race are not as utterly irredeemable as we are often told, he wrote in The Atlantic, would someone pretend to be tortured in this way because playing a singer on television is not as glamorous as getting beaten up by white guys. The unwillingness of both blacks and whites to acknowledge progress on racial equality is a long-running theme for McWhorter, who in 2000 published Losing the Race, Self-Sabotage in Black America, which argued that in most cases, racism is not an obstacle to people being the best that they can be. In an influential 2015 essay, McWhorter argued that anti-racism has become a new secular religion in America, complete with clergy, creed, and also even a conception of original sin. When is born marked by original sin, he writes, 
To be white is to be born with the stain of unearned privilege. Black people, he continues, will express their grievances and whites will agree that they are racist. You cannot rebuild your civilization with somebody else's babies. You've got to... On the right, McWhorter observes there's a growing sense of hostility on racial issues. And according to Gallup, the percentage of Americans who agree that black-white relations are good is at a 20-year low. And for the first time since the pollster has asked the question, a majority of blacks rate race relations as bad. I sat down with the 53-year-old McWhorter, the author or editor of 20 books, to talk about his upbringing in a mixed-race part of Philadelphia, his academic focus on Creole language, and the unmistakable signs of racial progress that an increasing number of Americans seem unwilling to acknowledge. I will link below to this interview. It's very interesting. Um, and John McWhorter, a, a linguist, a professor at Columbia University, yes, author of an awful lot of books, um, and uh, let's just, um, yeah. Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility book, bestseller, a bestseller for years. How did that happen? Hmm, perhaps there's an agenda to keep that book. And they say it's a bestseller. All they have to do is say it. All they have to do is write a New York Times headline. Oh, D'Angelo, White Fragility, bestseller. That's enough. That is enough for Americans. Just whatever mainstream media says, it's got to be true. It's not enough for most people on the right. On the left, it may be enough, but they're too afraid to say anything. And they better start speaking out against this agenda. Because it's creating an awful lot of anger. And when you factor this whole agenda, this race agenda, uh, factor it in to an awful lot of agendas taking place, like the economy and people losing jobs and people losing homes and being evicted from apartments and they don't have anything when people don't have anything to lose. They, can't, they can do anything. They lose it. I guess that's the saying. So, you know, what, what is so unbelievable about this agenda, the critical race theory um, and all of this race, the Black Lives Matter, <clears throat> I mean, the, the underlying premise is blacks can't make it on their own Whites hold them down. The white uh, American, they're the oppressor. And everybody non-white, well, but it's put into that black-white um, uh, dichotomy. Blacks are oppressed. White are the oppressor. Blacks are the oppressed. Now, you get a lot of these kids... And they're being taught by the authorities. They believe it. But then you see how many black Americans who are, who are so successful, it's like you're not going to acknowledge any progress that we've made in this country. That is the gaslighting that is taking place all over by the left. You know... The gaslighting, the lying. It's very real. And you know, so many people are getting so unbelievably um, you know, caught up in all of it, indoctrinated by all of it, angry by all of it. So... <laughs> White fragility. I mean, John McWhorter, he points out, you know, that it's demeaning. It's demeaning. Uh, all right.
again, yeah, we're going to have to be specific, white fragility, which basically says that black people are these hothouse flowers where everybody has to tiptoe around us, and, you know, we're always crying, and we're always angry, and we're just so very, very, very delicate. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I just want white people to understand, how much psychic and emotional labor people of color go through to to walk on eggshells around us. The emotional labor and the knots people of color tie themselves into so they don't trigger us uh, is just heart-wrenching. That is Robert, uh, Robin D'Angelo. And this woman clearly has an awful lot of issues. I have known an awful lot of people like her, the mannerisms, the affect, the almost um, the the, the uh, kind of emotional expression that borders on hysteria, and what they're talking about is an utter lie. You know, if we don't clear up our own issues, <laughs> we can do an awful lot of damage as this woman clearly, clearly shows. I mean, just watch her. Look at her. I mean, she's crazed. And if you, I, I, I actually had to listen to some interviews uh, you know, to, to try to understand where the hell this woman is coming from. Um, this woman is so deranged. Deranged. And with this critical race theory business and with this racism business, you can't get out of it. You know, if you claim that you're not a racist, well, that means you are a racist. And every white person has to do their work. You know, buy her book. You know, it's like, well, yeah, what did this man say? Certain class of race problem solvers. They make money. It's an industry. I mean, Robin D'Angelo has made a tremendous amount of money off of her racist work. Is she out there giving away her money to those black Americans who really need help? No. No. So, uh, sorry for... Oh, and to, I just can't stand it. I, it. You know, look, the lying, the lying, the lying. Anybody who is not upset by how much Americans lie, well, I don't think you really think truth is all that important. Why people to understand how much psychic and emotional labor people of color go through to to walk on eggshells around us. The emotional labor and the knots people of color tie themselves into so they don't trigger us uh, it is just heart wrenching. I don't feel like that person. That book is talking down to me as far as I'm concerned. It's it really should be called Black tables. Fragility. Right? Yes, yes, it should be used to keep tables from wobbling. That is the only use for that book. <laughs> and yet. You, you look on Facebook and you have people saying, I'm doing the work and reading this book. And I think to myself, <laughs> they are doing the work of making me into a perfect idiot. And I am going to start actively parsing it that way because I don't think people realize what silly babies books like that make us look like. So something, something needs to be said. <laughs> All right, well, this is what it's doing. Okay, Mr. Rose, don't try to get smart with me. Oh, I didn't come here for this. I don't care. I'm asking. No, then maybe you make a motion to adjourn the meeting because he is not going to speak to me in that manner. Okay. Okay. And if the business, if, if you want me to calm down, then everybody else needs to. Otherwise, I'll join the meeting. But you come after me, Mr. Rose, I'm coming back after wow. you, okay? Really sure. I think it's... Let's take a... Okay.
Madam Chair, I would like to make a example. When you talk about black lives don't matter, don't talk to me about that. When you talk about that. Just a moment. How do we expect our kids Wait, you, now, you, you should have never come in here with this bull crap then if you want to get along. Getting along is acknowledging who I am okay. as a person. Madam Chair, I make a motion we adjourn. Is there a second? second? Great, huh? School board meeting. School board meeting. Now, if you watch, and it's a very long school board meeting, they're talking about a uh, yearbook for the graduating class. And in it, uh, I guess, is uh, what was happening during 2020 and Black Lives Matter. Okay. But the whole, you know, <clears throat> emotions, no reasonable debate. It's emotions that that are fueling a, a lot of what they call debate. Now, did you listen to that woman? It's about her personally. Her personally. Really? No, it was about the school yearbook. So, the, the political correctness, the personal identity, the, I, oh my God, we're in trouble. We're in big, big trouble here. Yeah, you wanna hear another one? So I woke up this morning to see this type of bullshit on my fucking Facebook feed. And honestly, nothing infuriates me more than to see a black person defending a white person who does shit like go to HBCUs or joining a black fraternity. But here's my thing, right? Because I actually understand the mindset that y'all be having, which is, oh, it's just a school. It's just a sorority. Anybody can join. We can't expect racism to end if we keep excluding ourselves. But here's the thing, though, right? Because as a white person, you can go to any fucking university and you would be safe. You can join any of the majority fraternities and sororities and you would be fine. Where we don't have that fucking option. HBCUs and black fraternities and sororities are created as a safe space for us because we are not safe other places. Because white people have colonized everything else and excluded us from it. So why the fuck are white people now trying to infiltrate our shit? It's not our job to fix racism and allowing white people to do shit like this is eliminating that safe space for See, that kind of <clears throat> rhetoric is scary to me because I don't think there is any way possible to get through to that girl. She's so uh, rather passionate about the lies that she has been fed. Now, there's no doubt that white people have colonized a lot of the world, but why don't you look into history that clearly has been denied to a lot, to an awful lot of these kids? You know, um, oh, man. Okay, I, Thomas Sowell, I posted this video on my channel, The Real History of Slavery the real history. The scholars are not being brought in to this debate. I'd love to see Thomas Sowell debate Ibrin Kendi or Robin D'Angelo. But here he has, or whomever posted it, a nine minute video, facts about slavery they don't teach you at school. And I guess I'll play a few minutes of it, but I will link to it below. It really is very unfortunate that we have gotten to this point, but we got to this point because an awful lot of people are remaining silent, afraid to speak up. You know, uh, white Americans afraid to say anything 
because they're going to be deemed a racist. If you know who you are, if you know who you are, you stand firm and you can speak the truth. If you don't know who you are and, you know, you're not a racist, you, you're still, well, you got that white fragility, but it's not about racism. You're just a fragile human being, afraid that somebody's going to, well, break you, your fragileness. And I'm tired of it because it's, it's truly, you know, people have to find their courage because this has taken hold and a whole lot of people are speaking out about it, but we're not getting anywhere. So, um, and I'm going to be posting a lot of videos on this because you know what? There's an awful lot of agendas that are very, very important. This one, it has an immediate effect on all of these kids who are just going to school Monday through Friday, sitting in there, a lot of them wearing masks, which, you know, um, deprives them of the oxygen that they need for their healthy brains. So, and then, you know, we have an awful lot of parents who just don't really care about what's going on. They just want their kids, you know, to be gone for seven hours a day, Monday through Friday. Don't do anything. Then we have a lot of parents who are afraid. So, you know, for the parents who are speaking up, the reason why you're not getting anywhere is because you need more. And so when people ask you to speak on their behalf, you've got to tell them, no, you've got to come to the school board meetings. You have to become active. It's your child. And as a parent, your number one job is to keep that child safe from predators. And you put your child into these public schools, private schools, Catholic schools, all with this critical race theory, it's abuse. You send your child off to the predators every day. So yes, you have to get that courage to stand up for your children. Now, you know, because I've gone on too long, I will link below to this video, to uh, Thomas Sowell, the real history uh, of slavery. If you haven't seen these, I hope you click on the link below. I hope you circulate it. You know, there's an awful lot of people who just really don't know too much about this critical race theory. So your circulation of information, you know, that's your obligation. It's your obligation. You can just sit back and do nothing. You're no better than those implementing these programs. Or you can take on your responsibility as a human being to circulate truth.